when I was six years old, I heard the first sound, the first song on my dad's soundtrack. He opened up the heavy dark wood of our cabinet eight, cabinet eight track player and pressed in the tape. The music played and I listened as he described the genius of Simon and Garfunkel, often pausing for me to take it in. Listen to that, he would say. It was 1989. We often had music playing in our home. That was not unusual. But on this day, my first experience listening to Simon and Garfunkel, just before the song came to a close, our eight track player suddenly destroyed the tape. And I didn't get to hear the end of Bridge Over Troubled Water. I became very upset because I knew in my six-year-old heart how important that song was to my dad. And even if I wasn't able to describe it then, I tried in desperation with my tiny fingers to rewind the mangled tape, but he stopped me. He told me to leave it, that it didn't matter, and that the song didn't live on the eight track. In my frustration at the music dying out, I didn't understand what he meant. Without the tape, there was no song. But that night, as I laid in bed, bridge over troubled water softly rolled through the halls of our house with my dad at the piano. From beginning to end, the song moved through our hallways all the way to that final lyric that I hadn't yet heard. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will ease your mind. And finally, I realized what he meant. The song wasn't written on the tape. It was written in him. And now it was written in me. There were many nights I remember lying in bed as my dad played the piano, an instrument that I was now learning and falling in love with too. The music of John Denver, Joni Mitchell and the Beatles mixing into the subconscious space between sleep and awake. As a child, my favorite place to be was on the back seat of our family suburban. I would lay there with my full-size ghetto blaster, headphones on, eight extra D batteries in hand, just in case the music decided to go out, singing along to Michael Jackson, Celine Dion, to the worn folded lyrics tucked inside the crack cassette cases as we drove across the country. All those words to those songs became my magic, flowing from the center of my young heart all the way to the edges of my soul and back again. Volume one of my life. Music followed me into my teen years, and I remember the nights with my friends. We'd sleep in tents in our backyards, our stereos blasting dream lover into the darkness. We'd cry on the floor of my windowless bedroom about everything and nothing, quit playing games with my heart on repeat. We accosted Justin Timberlake in the bedding aisle of his Zellers, and we got soaked in the sweat of Janet Jackson from front row center seats we were never supposed to have. We danced to Mariah in front of full length mirrors, and rolled up in dark alleys in our parents' cars, bass thumping with Eminem and Dre. We laid under the stars in country music festivals with our muddy boots, singing She's My Kind of Rain. I became known for making definitively the greatest mix CDs of the decade, in particular for my multi-volume sets. I carefully crafted each playlist with unreliable dial-up internet connections using risky and often illegal song procurement methods, but I would spend days on each mix, pausing at the end to letter in the perfect mixtape title in black ink, which was usually some mashup of all the lyrics from all the songs and all the memories. The things I tried to be to the rest of the world didn't matter to my friends and never had. There was a freedom in the authenticity that we didn't even know that we shared. It was a blessed existence full of unconditional acceptance and support and a whole lot of music. I didn't fully understand at that time that the tracks on those mixes would become forever linked to my joy, permanently imprinted onto the person that I would become. It was the late 1990s and the music that flowed through me at that time began to take shapes on those discs and became the soundtrack to my years as a teenager and volume two of my life. <clears throat> as the years passed, I began to create a home that filled all the spaces that an adult would need to fill. I got married and I had my first daughter, but as I turned the corner into motherhood with all the uncertainties that transition brings with a constant teetering between bliss and exhaustion, one more big change was waiting just around the corner. On a day in June, when my daughter was four weeks old, I was sitting on my parents' couch when my dad delivered us the news. No intro, just straight to the chorus and completely out of nowhere. 
he had progressive stage four cancer and it was bad. I could not and did not process this at the time or perhaps even now. It was all a fog that I couldn't make sense of, a moment filled with frustration and sadness and my heart tried to untangle this reality, rewind back just an hour earlier or a week or a year. I couldn't understand what was happening. But then, still frozen on the couch and now nursing my baby through tears, I heard it. Bridge over troubled water. My dad sat down at the piano at what must have been one of the most difficult days of his life to ease our minds. I pulled out my phone and I took a video of that moment with the camera pointed at the wall because I just wanted to remember the sound of that song in the hallway in case it ever stopped. I existed in a space where there was no world where my dad wasn't. And so while everyone around me fall ap fell apart, I did not. I watched my dad fight for a year and then against all odds, come out on the other side of that troubled bridge, cancer free and around to meet my second daughter a year later. Holding it together this, during this time meant that my days were made up of the crying and the laughter of babies and toddlers and the unending noise and messiness of motherhood and of marriage, piles of laundry and gymnastics and daycare. And as the music fell largely silent for me, cooking began to replace the creative space that those harmonies once held when it was 2014. I would spend every, <clears throat> I'd spend an hour every Sunday planning an entire week of meals, scribbling all the recipes into pretty little notebooks that began as one and then turned into a habit that followed me for more than a decade. These notebooks made it possible for me to be organized enough with meals to squeak in a few extra moments with my daughters at the end of our busy day. But in many ways, they were the distraction from my music that at the time I couldn't find the will to play. We were raising our girls in the best way that we knew how. We vacationed and created memories of mountains and dinosaurs and oceans and Mickey Mouse. And I even started a business alongside my full-time corporate job, teaching other people to cook and to meal plan. I called it Basil and Bacon, my own new mashup and volume three of my life. During this time, I became accidentally disconnected from myself. In the busyness of motherhood and a flourishing corporate career, taking care of others and of making meals and holding it together, I found that my identity has shifted without warning until I became a person that I no longer recognized. All the joy from volume one and volume two had been forgotten and I was now living in a new volume, one filled with stress, and with busyness and sometimes sadness and one largely void of music. And then it was 2020. The life I had constructed to fill my void was suddenly torn down. The pandemic had me pause my business, Basil and Bacon, that I had created to replace the music. Basil and Bacon had me spending my evenings and weekends in other people's kitchens with other people's friends, and I couldn't do that anymore. And the corporate job I loved was filled with boardrooms and airplanes and hotels and strangers and cities that weren't mine, and now I couldn't do that either. All I had left was the meals. And every night, I still had to make dinner but it was quieter now. And the loss and the sadness and the frustration began to settle in. I tried to rewind and untangle the confusion and the grief, but what came instead was the thing that I had been missing all along. As I made dinner and played with the notes inside each recipe, an art I enjoyed now maybe as much as the piano, I felt deeply that it was no longer enough on its own. I had lost myself and all the other out volumes of my life with it and so much of my joy. But then one night I created a playlist. I turned on the music in my kitchen as I cooked dinner and I started to dance. I danced with my daughters around the table trying to make them understand the greatness in Alanis's lyrics. I would stop and hold out my arms and close my eyes. Listen to that, I would say, listen to that. And for the first time in over half a decade, the music began to come back. And in the days and the weeks and eventually the months that followed, while the world was silent and suspended, I sat down at the piano and the soundtrack of my life began to softly roll through the halls of my own home as my babies slept upstairs. And I started to sing again. I didn't need those old CDs, nor that eight track player or those old hallways. The music was within me. The volumes of my life in cracked and worn cases that I'd carried with me all of this time. And so, 
I invited them back. Alanis and Janet, Brittany and Mariah, Celine and Michael, Eminem and the Backstreet Boys, Simon and Garfunkel, and Becky, volumes one, two, and three. The music came to me like it had never left, and the lyrics flowed out of me like they never wanted to be understood more than in this moment. And in classic Becky style, I decided to mash up all the joyful memories from my past. I took songs that didn't naturally fit and I mashed them together. It was magic. And as I created, something in me began to change. I didn't need to give up music for cooking, nor did I need to give up cooking for music. I didn't need to forget the 8-track or the Ghetto Blaster because life is about every volume. The universe began screaming at me to mash up seemingly unrelated parts of myself in the same way I was bringing together John Lennon and Tupac to bring the music into my kitchen and to make me forget for a second. The world is upside down. And each playlist began to correspond with a recipe. If you want to bond me, my lover was Vietnamese sandwiches that went perfectly with the Spice Girls. Or like the time I added satay sauce to a Whitney Houston hit and it became, I want to dance with some satay. But because dinner is always needed and so is music, these things began to play together in harmony in my kitchen. And somewhere way down beneath the hard and the heavy, there was a lightness coming back to me, leading me to my joy again. You see, music connects emotions with, to memories with an influx of feel-good hormones, similar to the neurochemical bliss that we experience with love and drugs. When we make neural connections to a song, we create a strong memory trace that's filled with heightened emotion. And in many ways, the music becomes an auditory harbor for us, a safe place for us to return to. <clears throat> return to. And this music becomes synonymous with our identity. Our soundtracks literally become us. The different volumes of our lives mirrored in our playlists that we first carry as eight tracks or records and then cassettes and then CDs and now streaming magically to our fingertips. The music we carry in our hearts travels to the edges of our lives, but it always carries us back. The songs we love at joy-filled times hold a disproportionate amount of influence when it comes to our emotions. And what I've learned through motherhood and with my other love of cooking is that food does this too. To me, food was not just a distraction. It was an emotion. And when mashed up with the music, the effects of the two could be life-saving. By this time next week, volume four of my life will officially be published. My cookbook, filled not just with the upbeat recipes that filled my notebooks, but with the playlists that brought them to life. It is the soundtrack to my joy. It's all of the music and all of the food and all of the memories. This cookbook entitled Playlist Kitchen is all of me. With flared hip huggers and Stephanie Tanner, it's the feeling I got in a stadium with 20,000 strangers the, moments the, lights, the moment the lights went up. It's the way I can't forget how I felt with the windows down and a car full of friends while our song played on the radio. It's dancing in the kitchen and crying into the sink. It's the food I shared with my dad that year and the food I make for my growing kids. It's basil, it's bacon, it's Brittany, it's Becky. I returned to the joy of the backseat of my parents' old Suburban, to the full-length mirror and the mixed CDs of my teen years, and to the small bed I climbed into when I was six years old and first heard Bridge Over Troubled Water down the hallway from that piano. Maybe you have moments in your life that fall silent too, moments when you lose the dancing, or you lose the joy, and you lose the music, or even lose yourself in the happenings of motherhood and the endless meal making, or in grief of navigating a parent's scary diagnosis. But here is the thing about joy. I promise you that even in those moments, it is always within you. I don't know what your soundtrack is. Maybe your volumes feel similar to mine and maybe they don't. But I know that whatever it is, it is there. It's written on you as clearly and as deeply as the memories that mash together to form the person you are today. And sometimes the soundtrack just needs to be awakened by the flavors you once tasted or the lyrics you once sang or the piano you once played at. And sometimes a way to the other side of your troubled waters is simply to turn the music back on and to say to yourself, listen to that, listen to that.